Hello and welcome into another episode of Locked on Wolves. This is the post-game podcast. It's also the post-trade podcast. We're going to talk Wolves win over the Jazz, but also the big Mike Conley, D'Angelo Russell, three-team trade with the Lakers and Jazz. We're going to break it all down on the show here today. Why I like the Conley trade for Minnesota and why we already saw some of the benefits of that trade without Conley even on the floor in Wolves Jazz on Wednesday. We're going to break it all down here on the show. Welcome in. You are Locked on Wolves. You are Locked on Timberwolves. Your daily Minnesota Timberwolves podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello and welcome to the Locked On Wolves podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. My name is Ben Beacon. I'm the host of Locked On Wolves. Today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel Sportsbook, official sportsbook of Locked On. Make every moment more. Visit FanDuel.com slash Locked On today to get started. Happy Thursday, everybody. It's a victory Thursday for more reasons than one, for multiple reasons. The Wolves beat the Jazz handily on Wednesday night, a big bounce back after a atrocious loss in Denver on Tuesday, plus the Timberwolves acquired Mike Conley, traded out D'Angelo Russell in a three-team deal Wednesday. We're going to start there. I want to start with the trade and then tie that to something we already saw happen on Wednesday in the Jazz game, paying immediate dividends, in my opinion, from this trade and how that will impact the Wolves moving forward. There's a ton to get to today. A big thank you here off the top for making Lockdown Wolves your first listen every single day. Of course, this show is free and available everywhere, including YouTube, as well as all of your favorite audio platforms. You can also watch the show on the Lockdown Sports Minnesota app. You can download that on both Roku's and Amazon Fire TVs. Download the Lockdown Sports Minnesota app today and uh, get more great local sports coverage 24-7. It's absolutely free. Again, Lockdown Sports Minnesota on Roku and Amazon Fire TV. You can also follow the show on Twitter at Lockdown T-Wolves and also my account, which is below if you're watching on YouTube, at bbeacon. And that's with two B's, two E's, C-K-E-N. All right. There's a ton to get to. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to save some of it for Friday. Uh, if you missed it, I did an instant reaction show late Wednesday uh, following Wolves Jazz. I also did the post-game podcast or the post-game postcast with Marnie from Valley Sports North. So there's a lot out there. I want to go a little more in depth on a couple things I hit briefly on in the instant reaction show. So I want to set the stage for that. And then I want to kind of tie the trade to the Wolves Jazz game, do a little bit of a post game pod. But like, let's be honest, as great as that win was, like Conley didn't play, Rudy Gobert didn't play. Of course, Carl Anthony Towns didn't play. Like, obviously, D'Lo didn't play in that game. So, like, I think there's just more to talk about with the trade than there is with this game. But, you know, there's a very specific tie in that I'll get to here in a minute. Let's start with the trade itself. So, obviously, the Timberwolves. The, with D'Angelo Russell's salary this summer, the full thing comes off the books, but not really. They don't get to backfill that salary slot. So the Timberwolves had to trade D'Lo for something or let him walk, right? There were rumors related to the Miami Heat, Kyle Lowry, who knows how serious that was or how close it may have been. Uh, there was Clippers rumors. There were Mavericks rumors uh, that obviously changed a little bit with what happened with Dallas the last few days in terms of acquiring Kyrie and trading out Spencer Dinwiddie. Um, the Clippers thing, like, yeah, if the Wolves could have gotten Terrence Mann in a first rounder, I, that would have been great. That would have been better. And I said this a couple of weeks ago, actually, when those rumors were out there, the Conley rumor, the Lowry rumor, and the Clippers rumor. And I said the Clippers was my favorite rumor. The Heat was my second favorite. And I thought Conley was the least good of those. Now, of course, we didn't know it was a three-teamer. We didn't know, like, we just knew the Wolves were interested in Conley and the Jazz were open to that discussion, right? The Timberwolves knew they had to they had to do something. They weren't going to extend D'Angelo Russell, right? Like, keeping D'Angelo Russell and overpaying him doesn't make sense. If they could have gotten D'Lo for like $10 million a year, fine. That's not happening. D'Lo thinks he's going to get more than that. Somebody's going to pay for D'Angelo Russell's scoring numbers, for his shooting numbers, if he keeps up his hot shooting that he's had thus far this season. Um, trading D'Angelo Russell for a a serviceable veteran, solid, steady point guard in Mike Conley makes a ton of sense. Point guard, like when you're when you're handing the keys to Anthony Edwards, you don't need a high usage point guard like D'Angelo Russell. 
when Carlton Towns, you have two guys that could be one A scoring options on playoff teams in Carlton Towns and Anthony Edwards, which I realize that may be a controversial statement. One A and one B, right? Towns and Edwards are both all star caliber players. Towns has been an all star multiple times. Edwards will be probably next year. You don't need also to have D'Angelo Russell, somebody who was an all star once and fancies himself as an all star, but isn't doing all the all star things all the time, right? It's more important to have solid, steady production from a veteran player who can be a well-rounded player. You know what you're getting with Mike Conley. And I made this point on the on the uh, the immediate reaction pod Wednesday night. The D'Angelo Russell experience is a roller coaster. It really is. Like, his highs are really high. He's really, really good when he gets hot. A very tough offensive player to stop. And his defense has been better the last two years. So, like, yeah, there's been some high highs. These low lows, man. That game a week ago when he shot like four of 16 from the floor. How about most of the Memphis playoff series last year? Like the low lows for D'Lo are low. He can drag your team down on both ends of the floor. Offensively, he can carry you for short stretches and he can be passable defensively. And I think that averages out somewhere in the middle. I, I Like the results may be the same in terms of like in a vacuum, what D'Angelo Russell provides versus what Mike Conley could potentially provide this season in his role. I'm not saying that Conley is every bit as good as D'Lo, but I'm saying the highs and lows average out to a similar player, but he tanks your team so badly in those bad games and those like astronomically amazing shooting nights are few enough and far enough between. He's not carrying you multiple nights in a row like you're expecting Anthony Edwards or Carl Anthony Towns to do. Mike Conley's here. He's steady. He's going to give you what you expect night in and night out. And that's what the Wolves need. They don't need the high variance, the volatility that D'Angelo Russell brings to the table when you already have, you have Anthony Edwards, you have Carl Anthony Towns, you have Rudy Gobert. You have three players who at the start of the season were all considered top 25 players in the league. Now I know everybody's hates Rudy now and it, which is dramatic, but you know, and Carl Anthony Towns, there's, it's kind of the same thing, right? And of course, Ant has, didn't, Hasn't made the like the John Morant third year leap yet, right? He didn't make the All Star team, so all of a sudden everyone hates the Timberwolves. Why do you need D'Angelo Russell? But you you've got these three guys who all are focal points of the offense, or would like to be focal points of the offense. You don't also need the least efficient of the four of them. You know when they're all playing at their best, you don't need that variance, the volatility of D'Angelo Russell when you can get the solid steadiness of Mike Conley. And that's not even to getting back to my first point. D'Angelo Russell's a free agent this offseason. If you want Mike Conley next year at 24 million, you can have Mike Conley next year at 24.3 million. Or he's fully guaranteed for only 14.3 million next year. The Wolves have until two days after the draft this year to trade Conley before that last $10 million becomes guaranteed. So if the Wolves decide like, hey, we're not in on this Mike Conley experience or if his expiring deal next year could could be part of a bigger deal this offseason. The Wolves could trade him on draft night if they wanted to. Like that's an option. There will be likely suitors that'd be willing to take on that 14.3 million, waive him, and not have to be on the hook for the full 24.3. More likely than not, the Timberwolves keep him and play him next year. But there's a little bit of flexibility there with Delo. There's none. If tomorrow's, if Thursday, today's trade deadline comes and goes with the Angel Russell in a Wolves uniform. That's it. He walks this summer or you overpay him on an extension. So to get, again, a solid, steady player with Mike Conley, cost certainty, you know you can pencil in that 24.3 mil next year for your point guard slot for Mike Conley or the guaranteed 14.3 million. Instead of saying, well, it's either an extension for D'Lo or we sign, I don't know who, to a mid-level exception and split hit, you know that guy in Jordan McLaughlin's minutes, right? Like Now you know Mike Conley's in the fold for next season if you want him in the fold for next season. So I think this made sense from a salary perspective. I think that's clear. That, that's a big reason why this happened, right? Um, you get something for that salary slot. You have the flexibility to move Conley if you want to the offseason. Also, the trade gets the Wolves under the luxury tax for the summer. They're now $7 million or so below the luxury tax. I think a little more than that. Um, or sorry, excuse me, $17 million below the luxury tax. And they can make other moves to free additional cap space. They have a couple of minor expirings uh, in Nas Reed and Jalen Noel. Of course, they could extend Nas Reed. They could do something with Torian Prince. Um, 
there's other moves to be made, and this allows the flexibility that they would not have had if D'Angelo Russell was still in the books this summer. So that matters too. I want to talk more specifically about Conley's fit, and then I want to close by talking a bit about how we already saw how Anthony Edwards will benefit from not having D'Angelo Russell on the team moving forward um, and how that relates to the Jazz victory on or the victory over the Jazz on Wednesday night. So we'll do that here next. Today's episode of Lockdown Wolves is brought to us by our friends at FanDuel. This year, the only app you need at your Super Bowl party is FanDuel, America's number one sports book. We're super excited about our new sports betting partner for Locked On because they're the number one sports book in America. And if you're new to FanDuel, that's even better. They have so many great features that make betting on sports fun and easy. Download FanDuel now so you can bet Super Bowl 57 with a no sweat first bet. You'll get up to $3,000 back in bonus bets if your first bet doesn't win. FanDuel lets you bet on everything from the money line to point spreads to who will score a touchdown. Super Bowl is the best time to get involved on FanDuel. Trust me, I can't wait for this weekend. The FanDuel Sportsbook app is safe, secure, and super easy to use. Best of all, you can get paid your winnings instantly. So join FanDuel today at FanDuel.com slash LockedOn to claim your no-sweat first bet on Super Bowl 57. That's FanDuel.com slash LockedOn. Make every moment more with FanDuel, official sportsbook partner of the NFL. The NBA trade deadline is today, this afternoon. Lockdown has you covered. Today, the 9th, tune into Lockdown NBA on YouTube at 2 p.m. Eastern. That's 1 p.m. Central to hear reaction from the trades that will change the rest of the NBA season, who becomes contenders, and who's tanking for a better future. Subscribe to Lockdown NBA on YouTube and don't miss a deal. Uh, yours truly may make an appearance. The Wolves make a trade, probably will. Uh, maybe I'll be on to talk to you, Not really sure. So check in uh, with Lockdown NBA on YouTube. Again, 1 p.m. Central uh, this afternoon to watch the trade deadline special. All right. Let's talk a bit about the fit with Conley and the Timberwolves. And then I'll segue into Wolves Jazz. Um, it's going to be smooth, I promise. Uh, first of all, it's been a lot of hand wringing on Twitter about losing my, or excuse me, losing D'Angelo Russell's shooting, right? D'Lo shot the lights out. Go back to, I don't know, December 1st, January 10th, whatever. Arbitrary date you want to pick. Delo has been phenomenal shooting the ball. It's also overall, as of right now, as of the trade on February 8th, Delo's best overall shooting season. I talked about this a week ago or so, maybe two weeks ago, and I made the case that it's not sustainable because it's been so good, and he's had so many other issues that the shooting has really buoyed his overall performance. Like, I, I, I don't want to get too far down this path because, I, again, I talked about it a couple weeks ago, and Delo's not in the Wolves anymore, but... Delo's turnover rate was his highest since his first season in Brooklyn, which is five years ago. His assist rate was his lowest since his second season with the Lakers six years ago. Like those numbers are going in the wrong direction. Now, obviously he's initiating less offense, but the turnovers this year, some of those turnovers are been so sloppy. Tur uh, rebound rate, his second lowest of his career. Defensively, better than he was a couple years ago, certainly. But I don't think he's been as good this season as he was last year defensively on the ball. So a lot about D'Lo's season was not actually going that well, but because he shot the ball so well of late, it's kind of clouded, I think, the overall understanding of some of D'Lo's struggles this year. Like, he hasn't been all that great in a lot of areas. And even with the dynamic shooting ability of D'Angelo Russell, which he's a dynamic shooter, I, I, I truly think that. Mike Conley is a better catch and shoot player than D'Angelo Russell. And what's most important when you're playing with a ball dominant, a budding superstar, I would call him and Anthony Edwards catch and shoot three point shooting. You don't need somebody who's going to shoot a bunch off the dribble and be really successful shooting off the dribble threes and pick and roll because that's Anthony Edwards job. It's Carl Anthony Towns job to be a high usage player in your offense. You need guys that are going to catch and shoot and make. And D'Lo is a fine catch and shoot three point shooter. He is. He's fine. He's good. Mike Conley's better. This season, D'Angelo Russell catch and shoot threes, depending on where you look, um, thirty yeah, about thirty eight percent. I want to get the exact. I, I, there's actually a couple different. All these sites are slightly different in in how they actually evaluate. Uh, the catch and shoot numbers and some of the different things, but it's like, it's high thirties and I'm going to get the exact number. 
Uh, this season, D'Angelo Russell, 20, or thir- excuse me, 38.5% catch and shoot threes. That's fine. Roughly league average for catch and shoot, right? You, you can handle that. Uh, according to B-Ball Index, bball-index.com, B-Ball Index has him at 69th percentile or grades out as a B league-wide for catch and shoot three-point shots. This season, Mike Conley, 41.9% catch and shoot threes. 41.9% catch and shoot threes. Uh, B ball index actually has him at 42.9%. That's 87th percentile league wide and A minus. 87th percentile on catch and shoot threes from anywhere on the floor for Mike Conley. 69th percentile for D'Angelo Russell on catch and shoot threes. So do, oh, let's do this. Let's go back even further. Let's go back another year. Go back to last year. D'Angelo Russell was just 34.4% catch and shoot threes. Caveat, it was his worst shooting season. Then again, this year's his best shooting season overall. So maybe it's somewhere in the middle, right? Like, I, I, that's why I'm giving the two year sample, right? So this year, 38.5% on catch and shoot threes for Deal. Last year, 21 22, uh, 2021 2022, Deal was just 34.4% on catch and shoot threes. What was Mike Conley, you ask? 41.4% catch and shoot threes. Remember when I talked about consistency earlier? I was just talking about overall game. How about catch and shoot threes? Mike Conley, 41.4% last year, 41.9% this year. D'Lo, 34% to 38.5%. Conley's a better catch and shoot three-point shooter than D'Angelo Russell. That matters more in the Timberwolves offense than pull up threes in transition. It matters more in the Timberwolves offense than pulling up in pick and roll game, which by the way, Conley hasn't been great there, but he's only a couple percentage points off what D'Lo has done this year in terms of it, pulling up behind a pick and roll and shooting a three. D'Lo and Conley are in the same neighborhood. Like that's not a major difference. And clearly when you factor in catch and shoot, Conley's got the edge there. Yeah. Conley's a little bit lower on volume, but like, that's the whole point, right? And it's not a lot either. It's like, uh, I think two, three point attempts per hundred possessions over the past three years. D'Lo shot about two more threes per hundred possessions than Conley. So it's not a massive, you know, Delta there. But that's also the point. You don't want somebody who's high, super high volume in any way playing with Carl Anthony Towns, Anthony Edwards, Rudy Gobert, Jaden McDaniels, right? Like that's another thing we'll talk about later. That's probably a Friday topic is McDaniels developing his game and getting the opportunity to play more, to, to do more offensively. So um, shooting wise, Conley's actually, eh, he's better. Catch and shoot. It's more important. Catch and shoot threes in the Wolves offense than what D'Lo does. Last thing on shooting, corner three-pointers, which is a relatively small sliver. Like it's it's like 12 to 15% of the number of threes, you know, of, of the overall, all the threes that Conley's taking, and we're talking less than 15%. But as a corner three-point shooter, I'll give you D'Lo's number first. D'Lo is 35.6%. That's 48th percentile this season as a corner three-point shooter. Grades out as a C on B-ball index. New friend, Mike Conley, 63.3% on corner threes. That is otherworldly. That's nearly two out of every three three three-point attempts from the corners this season Mike Conley's making. As you might guess, that's 97th percentile. I'd like to know who's better than that. Grades out as an A-plus on B-ball index. And that's not that's not like a crazy outlier. For his career, Mike Conley's, I mean, it is because it's 63%. But in terms of being really good from the corner, right? Conley, for his career, 43% from the corners uh, on three point attempts last year is actually his worst season. Um, if you look at seasons when he didn't get like, he, there was one year he played only 12 games a few years ago in Memphis. I think he had a knee injury. Um, you'd have to go back to 2014 to find the last time that Conley wasn't over 42% from the corners on three point attempts. D'Angelo Russell for his career from the corner, 41% this year, 34% last year, 39 and percent. So Mike Conley, more consistent, more comfortable shooting corner threes and corner threes were a really big part of the Rudy Gobert, Donovan Mitchell, Mike Conley, um, Bogdanovich, Bogdanovich, excuse me, Utah Jazz offensive teams, right? Those corner, I talked about this a few weeks ago related to Bogdanovich and like, hey, if the Wolves could just, if Towns could just be a souped up Bogdanovich, which is like, obviously he's capable of, I mean, Bogdanovich is a really good player. Like corner threes are vital to this Timberwolves offense and 
I'll, I, I do want to get into the Wolves Jazz comparison. That's also a Friday topic. Not, not all on today's show. But before you get too cynical, trying to get ahead of the straw man argument here, I guess, about the Timberwolves, or excuse me, about, yeah, about the Timberwolves replicating what the Jazz did and didn't the Jazz lose in the second round and, you know, the Wolves should be setting their sights higher, all that stuff. Well, first of all, it'd be great to be the best regular season team in the league for several years like the Jazz were. It would also be great to get to the second round. Third of all, there's a lot of differences between that Jazz team and this Timberwolves team in a good way. But the Wolves are already replicating the good parts of it, right? The defense, they're already a top 10 defense with Rigo Barrett. It's the offense that's the issue. So I want to get into that Friday. We'll talk more about that. Um, I also want to, you know, I thought I was going to get more into the Conley Gobert stuff today, uh, like their min- their uh, numbers playing together. I'll talk about that Friday too. I've already like, it's a packed show Friday as well, but I do want to get to the Wolves Jazz game on Wednesday. Let's just say that they're, they're good. I'll, I'll leave you with this. The Conley Gobert two-man lineup in Utah just last season, I, you know, we can go back further, but just last season of their top 10 minutes played, uh, two man lineups. Conley and Gobert was the Jazz' best two man lineup. Their net rating was a plus nine point two, better than every other of the two man lineups that were in the top ten for Utah last season in terms of minutes played. Conley and Gobert play well together. They have a solid pick and roll chemistry. Defensively, having a veteran who's understands the concepts and is willing to play hard all or most of the time is a step forward from what the Wolves were doing with D'Angelo Russell. So um, I should note quickly, Conley has dropped off defensively as a one-on-one defender. Like there's no question about that. Like uh, I test would tell you that metrics would tell you that ESPN defensive real plus minus last year. Mike Conley actually had the second best defensive real plus minus of any point guard in the league, a plus 6.23, which is incredible. Overall, he was fifth among point guards, defense and offense together, real plus minus. This year, he's 33rd in defensive real plus minus among point guards, a minus 1.17. That is a precipitous drop-off. There's other factors. Real plus minus attempts to pull out some of the noise of teammates and um, you know regulate for possessions and stuff like that. But it's not perfect. Conley's playing on a Jazz team that doesn't have Rudy Gobert this year, and clearly that would still have an impact, right? Um so all that to say, Conley is not the one-on-one defender he was in his heyday with Memphis or even earlier in his Utah career, but he's still a good team defender and he's still a, I think, a better fit for the Timberwolves defensively, what they're trying to do than what D'Angelo Russell was. We'll get to that Friday too. There's a ton to get to, but I do want to talk Wolves Jazz. And I mentioned Anthony Edwards earlier and how well he played against the Jazz. And I want to get into that. And it's it's so much of it is because of with no D'Angelo Russell, who's in who's in charge of the offense? One hundred percent of the time when he's on the floor, it's Anthony Edwards. He is running the offense, and we saw him take the keys and go on a, gy- a joy ride against the Utah Jazz on Wednesday night in Salt Lake City. So I want to talk about that, the Jazz game specifically, and Ants game here in just a moment. All right, the Timberwolves beat the Jazz on Wednesday easily by 25, 143 to 118, 24 hours after they had 146 points scored on them in Denver by the Nuggets. The Wolves turn around, again, 24 hours later, at altitude, and drop 143 on their opponent, beating a Jazz team that, of course, was also shorthanded after making, you know, you know, no Beasley, no Conley, no Vanderbilt. The Timberwolves, of course, didn't have D'Angelo Russell. They also didn't have Rudy Gobert. They didn't have Kyle Anderson. And obviously, no Carl Anthony Towns, like a very shorthanded Timberwolves team as well. I mean, Josh Minot was playing rotation minutes for the first time this season, but he earned them after playing extremely well in garbage time, a quarter and a half of garbage time against the Nuggets on Tuesday. In fact, Minot tied for the team lead in minutes. Play, uh, and I guess he hadn't played 33 minutes, tied for second in minutes played on the team against the uh, the Jazz on Wednesday. Um, we'll talk about Minot in a second. First, Anthony Edwards in this game, 31 points on 13 of 27, a very high volume shooting night for him. But he got really hot in the third quarter, four of nine shooting from three. He hit, I think, three of those four threes in the third. He only had one free throw attempt on 27 shots, which is insane. Um, 
he should have gotten the line more often in this game. Uh, I'll just leave it at that. Like one free throw attempt. He attempted 16, no, 18 two point shots in this game. He shot a few mid rangers, but like, you can't tell me Anthony Edwards shot the ball 18 times inside the arc and got fouled once. That's not a, that's not what, that's not what happened. Like it's ridiculous. Anyway, it was good. Very, very good. And we saw kind of a glimpse of like first quarter, third quarter, Ant was unstoppable in this game. It was, hey, I'm in charge. This is my team now. I'm going to take the keys. I'm going to get into the paint. I'm going to shoot, you know, impossible step backs from everywhere. And he can do that. Like, that's the other benefit of this trade is there's no question now who's Who's the straw that serves the drink for this offense? Who's initiating the offense for this team? Kyle Anderson will do that when he's back. Obviously, Jordan McLaughlin is your, your primary backup point guard, and Mike Conley is your point guard. But Ant is the one who is initiating offense, similar to what Donovan Mitchell did in Utah the last several years. Different, but in, in a similar way, right? And Conley is going to play a similar role to what he did in Utah, and Rudy's going to play a similar role to what he did in Utah. But this was a, a perfect example of like, Immediately after the trade, we saw this start paying dividends with Anthony Edwards play eight assists, seven rebounds, only one turnover in this game for Anthony Edwards, which was an absolute breath of fresh air. I, I mentioned the, uh, the turnover issues for the wolves first segment towards the beginning of the show and how Dilo was a, a major culprit for that, but also Ant Anthony Edwards only had one turnover in this game. He only played 21 minutes against Denver Tuesday, but had one turnover in that game. He only had two turnovers in the win over Denver on Saturday. Ants had a run going all the way back to January 19th, where in nine games, how do I want to say this? In um, eight of nine games, Ants had four or more turnovers. And actually, seven of nine games, he had five or more turnovers during that span. Since then, one turnover against Utah, one against Denver in, in shorter minutes, and two against Denver the, the, uh, in the win on, on Sunday. So four turnovers in his last, like, uh, roughly 85 minutes played. Actually, exactly 85 minutes played. Four turnovers in 85 minutes played after averaging over five turnovers in the nine games previous to that. So I think part of that is is more decisiveness. He's going to the basket more. He did shoot nine threes in this game, but he only shot three threes last time out, five threes the time before that. He's getting to the bat or getting into the paint more. Um, and being more decisive with what he's doing. He's also like eight assists in this game, right? Ant's going to have more space to operate. Again, he knows he's in charge. He knows it's his team. You know, we'll figure out the Carlton Town stuff when he comes back. But there's one less mouth to feed now, right? Like Mike Conley doesn't need his shots. He'll get some shots. But again, catch and shoot threes. You want Conley to get those shots. So there's a huge benefit here to letting Edwards do what Edwards wants and needs to do. The other thing is Jade McDaniels. I mean, Jade McDaniels moves up a rung in the pecking order now in terms of offensive options. Like if ants off the floor, if cats off the floor, if Rudy's off the floor, McDaniels is a legit like third option now at any given point in time. He had 14 and four and four in this game, 14 points, four rebounds, four assists. And uh, was had the second best plus minus on the team with a plus 20 in this game. Shot five of seven from the floor. McDaniels has been playing extremely well of late too. And the Wolves no doubt want to develop his offensive game a bit more. Um, and we've seen those flashes this season. Pretty frequently. We saw it a lot like early January. And then, you know, there were a couple of rough performances in there. And then again, lately, but like foul trouble hasn't been quite as big of a deal as it was earlier this season. And a game like this, it was two games ago. The Denver went on Sunday. He had 14, six assists and four rebounds, no turnovers, scored 14 points on 10 shots, didn't attempt a single three pointer. So like he's doing it in different ways. He's being more decisive instead of the one dribble, pull up tough mid ranger, or, you know, some of the mistakes he was making his first two seasons in the league. Those are going away. McDaniels is going to be developed quick, more quickly now, have more of a role. Um, and that's another benefit of, of the Conley D'Angelo Russell trade. Putting a bow in Wolves Jazz, we should talk about Jalen Noel briefly. 30 points on 16 shots, six assists, and no turnovers for Noel. An otherworldly plus 38 in the plus minus category in 29 minutes on Sunday against the Nuggets. 
Jalen Noel was a plus 35, and that was in 27 minutes. So he's a plus 35 in 27 minutes. In this game, a plus 38 in 29 minutes. And I don't usually love individual game, single single player, single game, individual, plus minus, because it's super noisy. Like, there's just so many factors that you can't consider. But, like, he's been incredible in these games. He had 16, 4, and 4 with no turnovers in that last game, a plus 35. In this game, 36 and 4 with two steals and no turnovers. And was a plus 38. I have no idea if Jalen Noel is going to get traded today before the deadline. Uh, He might. But, like, this is the Jalen Noel that Chris Finch wanted to give minutes to this season and was okay with trading Malik Beasley and Patrick Beverly because it freed up minutes for Jalen Noel because Noel can play and score like this. He was really, really good in this game. Josh Minot off the bench, 12 and 11 in 29 minutes, a double-double, two blocks and a steal, no turnovers for Minot. I don't know how you keep him out of the rotation. Like, I know this is one game, but he played well in garbage time on Tuesday. Maybe you give Kyle Anderson another night off. See what happens Friday. Give Minot some run in Memphis. Uh, Rivers will be back. Um, of course, there's still like nagging injuries. Like I said to Anderson, um, McLaughlin still in a minutes limit. Like there's still some minutes to kind of be hashed out. And if Ant's going to be running points anyway, uh, there could be some minutes in there on the wing for Josh Minot. I'm just like, I'm intrigued. I think he is a rotation player next year. And he looked like one in this game. Luca Garza, 25 points off the bench. A lot of that was garbage time, but he did hit four threes, played well in this game. Um, in general, a very impressive performance for Minnesota, a very shorthanded Wolves team against a shorthanded Jazz team, but a very important bounce back win after an atrocious performance in Denver on Tuesday. So um, big Wolves win. They go to Memphis Friday. We'll talk about that on Friday's show. So let me lay this out on Friday. We will preview Wolves Grizzlies. We'll talk about anything else that happens at the deadline on Tuesday, Wolves related, which who knows? I mean, if I guess if that's the case, blow up all my plans for Friday. I want to get into the Rudy Conley pairing in Utah a bit more. Uh, I want to talk about what to expect in Minnesota and similarities and differences between this iteration of the Timberwolves and the previous iteration of the Utah Jazz. Pros and cons about about like that comparison, really, because there's there's both. Um, but also why I think the, this Wolves team is better set up for success, and even in the playoffs, than the Gobert, Conley, Mitchell Jazz teams. So we'll do that Friday. That's all I have for you today. Um, again, if anything happens during the day, Tuesday, I'll try and get some breaking news, uh, breaking news show up, at least some quick reactions. So stay tuned for all that. Um, otherwise we'll see you Friday for the show, uh, for Friday's show, Friday morning. And then of course, Friday night after Wolves Grizzlies, we'll go live with Marnie Gellner of Valley Sports North, as we always do on the Lockdown Sports Minnesota YouTube channel. A big thank you to those of you that do make Lockdown Wolves your first listen every day. Of course, this show is free and available everywhere, wherever you listen to podcasts, including YouTube as well as all of your favorite audio platforms. You can also watch the show on the Lockdown Sports Minnesota app on both Roku and Amazon Fire TV. You can follow on Twitter at Lockdown T Wolves. Don't forget the T. And also at B Beacon with two B's, two E's, C-K-E-N. Of course, the Lockdown Wolves podcast is part of the Lockdown Podcast Network. Remember, the Lockdown Network is your local experts on all the biggest stories. Now make your second listen, the Game to Game NBA podcast. Every moment, every top performance, and every result. Lockdown Game to Game covers every game from across the NBA with local analysis that only Locked On can deliver. Follow Game to Game on Locked On NBA, available on the Odyssey app, YouTube, and wherever you get your podcasts. Once again, I'm Ben Beacon. This is the Locked On Wolves podcast, and we'll catch you next time.